Good evening and welcome to another edition of the Legacy of Queens. It's Sunday, April 30th, 2023. And I'm your host, Jason DeCanio, on, and we're welcoming you back to uh, our regularly scheduled uh, Legacy show here on YouTube and, of course, Spotify for podcasters. We'll get to that in a little while. I'll talk to you about what happened with the merger there. Uh, tonight, we're focusing on a legend that just passed a few days ago. Um, and we also tributed another person on Thursday as well uh, that uh, passed uh, before this gentleman that we had talked about tonight as well. So we have had a lot of passings within the previous couple of days, and we just couldn't get to touch base on all of them, so we're trying to catch up now. Uh, we'll let you know at the end of and then to this program what's coming up next week. This is episode 73. And tonight we're tributing the gentleman who passed away just five days ago. One American singer and actor and activist who popularized Calypso music with international audiences in the 1950s. And he's one of the few performers to have received an Emmy, a Grammy, an Oscar, and a Tony. Although he won the Oscar in a non-competitive category. And he earned his career breakthrough with the album Calypso. In 1956, which was the first million-selling LP by a single artist, he's known for his uh, best known for his recordings of Deo, the Banana Boat song, Jump in the Line, Shake Sonora, Jamaica Farewell, and Mary's Boy Child, and he recorded and performed in many genres, including blues, folk, gospel, show tunes, and American standards. He also starred in films such as Carmen Jones, Island in the Sun, Odds Against Tomorrow, Buck and the Preacher and Uptown Saturday Night. He made his final screen appearance in Spike Lee's Black KKK Klansman in 2018. Considered the actor, singer, and activist Paul Robinson as a mentor, and he was a close confidant of Martin Luther King Jr. And during the civil rights movement of the 50s and 60s, he was also a vocal critic of the policies of George W. Bush and Donald Trump, Belfonte, well, I just gave it away, acted as the American Civil Liberties Union Celebrity Ambassador for Juvenile Justice Issues. And he won three Grammy Awards, including the Lifetime Grammy Achievement Award, an Emmy, and a Tony. In 1989, he received the Kennedy Center Honors, and he was awarded the National Medal of Arts in 1994. And then in 2014, he received the Gene Herschelt Humanitarian Award, at the Academy's 6th Annual Governor's Awards in, in 2022, was inducted into the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in the Early Influence category. 96-year-old Harry Belafonte, born Harold George Belafonte Jr., will look at him tonight on The Legacy of Queens. It's Sunday evening, and welcome once again to the Legacy of Queens. I'm your host, Jason DiCanio. Let's talk about the man who passed away just five days ago at the age of 96 in New York City, Harry Belafonte. Born Harold George Belafonte Jr. on March 1st, 1927 at Lying In Hospital in Harlem, New York City, the son of Jamaican-born parents Harold George Belafonte Sr., who worked as a chef and Melvin Love, a housekeeper. There are disputed claims of his father's place of birth, which is also stated as Martinique, a French territory in the West Indies. His mother was the child of a Scottish Jamaican mother and an Afro Jamaican father, and his father was the child of an Afro Jamaican mother and a Dutch Jewish father of Sephardic Jewish descent. Harry Jr. was raised Catholic, and attended parochial school at St. Charles Borromero. From 1932 to 1940, Belfonte lived with one of his grandmothers in her native country of Jamaica, where he attended 
Wilmer's Schools. Now, upon returning to New York City, he dropped out of George Washington High School, after which he joined the U.S. Navy and served during World War II. In the 1940s, he was working as the janitor's assistant when a tenant gave him, as a gratuity, two tickets to see the American Negro Theater. He fell in love with the art form and also befriended Sidney Poitier. The financially struggling pair regularly purchased a single seat to local plays, trading places in between acts after informing the other about the progression of the play. Well, at the end of the 1940s, Belafonte took classes in acting at the dramatic workshop of the New School in New York City with the influential German director Erwin Piscator, alongside Marlon Brando, Tony Curtis, Walter Matthau, B. Arthur, and Portier, while performing with the American Negro Theater and he subsequently received a Tony Award for his participation in the Broadway review John Murray Anderson's Almanac. He also starred in the 1955 Broadway review Three for Tonight with Gower Champion. He started his career in music as a club singer in New York to pay for his acting classes. The first time he appeared in front of an audience, he was backed by the Charlie Parker Band, which included Charlie Parker himself, Max Roach, and Miles Davis, among others. He launched his recording career as a pop singer on the Roost label in 1949, but quickly developed a keen interest in folk music, learning material through the Library of Congress's American Folk Songs archives. With guitarist and friend Millard Thomas, Belafonte soon made his debut at the legendary jazz club, The Village Vanguard, and he signed a contract with RCA Victor in 1953, recording regularly for the label until 1974. He also performed during the Rat Pack era in Las Vegas, Belafonte's first widely released single, which went on to become his signature audience participation song in virtually all his live performances, was Matilda, recorded on April 27, 1953. Belafonte's breakthrough album Calypso in 1956 became the first LP in the world to sell more than one million copies within a year. He stated that it was the first million-selling album ever in England. The album is number four on Billboard's top 100 album list for having spent 31 weeks at number one, 58 weeks in the top 10, and 99 weeks on the U.S. chart. The album introduced American audiences to Calypso music, which had originated in Trinidad and Tobago in the early 19th century. And Belafonte was dubbed the King of Calypso a title he wore with reservations since he had no claims to any Calypso Monarch titles. One of the songs included in the album is the now-famous Banana Boat song listed as Deo on the Calypso LP, which reached number five on the pop chart and featured its signature lyric, Deo. Many of the compositions recorded for Calypso, including Banana Boat song and Jamaica Farewell, gave songwriting credit to Irvin Bergie. While primarily known for Calypso, he recorded in many different genres, including blues, folk, gospel, show tunes, and American standards. His second most popular hit, which came immediately after the Banana Boat song, was the comedic tune Mama Look at Boo Boo, also known as Mama Look at Boo Boo, originally recorded by Lord Melody in 1955 in which he sings humorously about misbehaving and disrespectful children. It reached number 11 on the pop chart. In 1959, he starred in Tonight with Belafonte, a nationally televised special that featured Odetta, who sang Waterboy, and who performed a duet with Belafonte on of There's a Hole in My Bucket that hit the national charts in 1961. Belafonte was the first Jamaican-American to win an Emmy, for Revlon Review, Tonight with Belafonte in 1959. Two live albums, both recorded at Carnegie Hall in 1959 and 60, enjoyed critical and commercial success. And from his 1959 album, Hava Nigeria, became part of his regular routine and one of his signature songs. He was one of many entertainers recruited by Frank Sinatra to perform at the inaugural gala of President John F. Kennedy in 1961, which included Ella Fitzgerald, Mahalia Jackson, and others. And later that year, RCA Victor released another Calypso album, Jump Up Calypso, which went on to become another million seller. 
During the 60s, he introduced several artists to U.S. audiences, most notably South African singer Miriam Makeba and Greek singer Nena Muskori. His album Midnight Special in 62 included a young harmonic player named Bob Dylan. As the Beatles and other stars from Britain began to dominate the U.S. pop charts, Belafonte's commercial success diminished. 1964's Belafonte at the Greek Theater was his last album to appear in Billboard's Top 40. His last hit single, A Strange Song, was released in 67 and peaked at number 5 on the adult contemporary music charts. Belafonte received Grammy Awards for the albums Swing That Hammer in 1960 and An Evening with Belafonte and Makeba in 65. The later album dealt with the political plight of black South Africans under apartheid. He earned six gold records. During the 60s, he appeared on TV specials alongside such artists as Julie Andrews, Petula Clark, Lena Horne, and Nana Muscori. And then in 1967, he was the first non-classical artist to perform at the prestigious Saratoga Performing Arts Center in upstate New York, soon to be followed by concerts there by The Doors, The Fifth Dimension, The Who, and Janis Joplin. From February 5th to the 9th of 1968, he guest hosted The Tonight Show, substituting for Johnny Carson. Among his interview guests were Martin Luther King Jr. and Senator Robert F. Kennedy. His fifth and final Calypso album, Calypso Carnival, was issued by RCA in 1971. Belafonte's recording activity slowed considerably after releasing his final album for RCA in 74. And from the mid-70s to the early 1980s, Belafonte spent the greater part of his time on tour, which included concerts in Japan, Europe, and Cuba. And in 1977, Columbia Records released the album Turn the World Around with a strong focus on world music. Then in 1978, he was a guest star on the episode of The Muppet Show, on which he performed his signature song, Deo. However, the episode is best known for Belafonte's rendition of the spiritual song Turn the World Around from the album of the same name, which he performed with specially made Muppets that resembled African tribal masks. It became one of the series' most famous performances and was reportedly Jim Henson's favorite episode. After Henson's death in May of 1990, Belafonte was asked to perform the song at Henson's memorial service. Turn the World Around was also included in the 2005 official hymnal supplement of the Unitarian Universalist Association Singing the Journey. From 79 to 89, he served on the Royal Winnipeg Ballet's Board of Directors. He released his first album of original material in over a decade called Paradise in Gazankulu in 1988 and contained 10 protest songs against the South African former apartheid policy and was his last studio album. In the same year, Belafonte, as UNICEF Goodwill Ambassador, attended a symposium in Harare, Zimbabwe, to focus attention on child survival and development in South African countries. As part of the symposium, he performed a concert for UNICEF. A Kodak video crew filmed the concert, which was released as a 60-minute concert video titled Global Carnival. Following a lengthy recording hiatus, an evening with Harry Belafonte and friends, a soundtrack and video of a televised concert were released in 1997 by Island Records. The Long Road to Freedom, an anthology of black music, a huge multi-artist project recorded by RCA during the 60s and 70s, was finally released by the label in 2001. Belafonte well, went on the Today Show to promote the album on September 11th of 2001 and was interviewed by Katie Couric just minutes before the first plane hit the World Trade Center. The album was nominated for the 2002 Grammy Awards for Best Boxed Recording Package for Best Album Notes and for Best Historic Album. He received the Kennedy Center Honors in 1989. He was awarded the National Media of Arts in 94, and he won a Grammy Lifetime Achievement Award in 2000. He performed sold-out concerts globally through the 50s to the 2000s, and his last concert was a benefit concert for the Atlanta Opera on October 25th of 2003. In a 2007 interview, he stated that he had since retired from performing. But then on January 29, 2013, Belafonte was the keynote speaker 
and 2013 honoree for the MLK Celebration Series at the Rhode Island School of Design. He used his career and experiences with Dr. King to speak on the role of artists as activists. He was inducted as an honorary member of the Phi Beta Sigma fraternity on January 11, 2014. In March of the same year of 2014, he was awarded an honorary doctorate from Berklee College of Music in Boston. <coughs> in 2017, he released When Colors Come Together, an anthology of some of Belafonte's earlier recordings produced by, son, by his son David, who wrote lyrics for an updated version of Island in the Sun, arranged by longtime Belafonte musical director Richard Cummings, and featured Harry Belafonte's grandchildren, Serafina and Amadeus, as a, and a children's choir. Well, Belafonte starred in numerous films. His first film role was in Bright Road in 1953, in which he supported female lead Dorothy Dandridge. The two subsequently starred in Otto Preminger's hit musical Carmen Jones in 54. Ironically, ironically, Belafonte's singing in the film was dubbed by an opera singer, as was Dandridge's, but both voices being deemed unsuitable for their roles. Using his star clout, Belafonte was subsequently able to realize several then controversial film roles. In, 19, in 1957's Island in the Sun, there are hints of an affair between Belafonte's character and the character played by Joan Fontaine. The film also starred James Mason, Dandridge, Joan Collins, Michael Rennie, and John Justin. In 1959, he starred in and produced, through his company Harbell Productions, Robert Wise's Odds Against Tomorrow, in which he plays a bank robber uncomfortably teamed with a racist partner, Robert Ryan. He also co-starred with Inger Stevens in The World, The Flesh, and The Devil. Belafonte was offered the role of Porgy in Preminger's Porgy and Bess, where he would have once again starred opposite Dandridge, but refused the role because he objected to its racial stereotyping. Sidney Poitier played the role instead. Dissatisfied with most of the film's roles offered to him during the 60s, he concentrated on music. In the early 70s, Belafonte appeared in more films, among which are two with Poitier, Buck and the Preacher in 1972 and Uptown Saturday Night in 74. Then in 84, he produced and scored the musical film Beat Street, Dealing with the rise of hip-hop culture, together with Arthur Baker, he produced the gold-certified soundtrack of the same name. Belafonte next starred in a major film in the 90s, appearing with John Travolta in the race reverse drama White Man's Burden in 95, and in Robert Altman's jazz-age drama Kansas City in 96, the latter of which garnered him the New York Film Critics Circle Award or Best Supporting Actor. He also starred as an Associate Justice of the Supreme Court of the United States in the TV drama Swing Vote in 1999. And then in 2006, he appeared in Bobby Emilio Estevez's ensemble drama about the assassination of Robert F. Kennedy. He played Nelson, a friend of an employee of the Ambassador Hotel, Anthony Hopkins. And his final film appearance was in Spike Lee's Academy Award-winning Black KKK Klansman 2018 as an elderly civil rights pioneer. He is said to have married politics and pop culture. Belafonte's political beliefs were greatly inspired by the singer, actor, and civil rights activist Paul Robeson, who mentored him. Now, Robeson opposed not only racial prejudice in the United States, but also Western colonialism in Africa and Belafonte refused to perform in the American South from 1954 until 61. Then in 1960, Belafonte appeared in a campaign commercial for Democratic presidential candidate John F. Kennedy. Kennedy later named Belafonte cultural advisor to the Peace Corps. Belafonte supported Lyndon B. Johnson for the 1964 United States presidential election, and he gave the keynote address at the ACLU of Northern California's annual Bill of Rights Day celebration in December of 2007 and was awarded the Chief Justice Earl Warren Civil Liberties Award. The 2011 Sundance Film Festival featured the documentary film Sing Your Song, a biographical film focusing on Belafonte's contribution to and his leadership in the civil rights movement in America and his endeavors to promote social justice globally. 
In 2011, Belafonte's memoir, My Song, was published by Knopp Books. He supported the civil rights movement in the 1950s and 60s and was one of Martin Luther King Jr.'s confidants. He provided for King's family since King earned only $8,000. That's about $80,000 in today's time a year as a preacher. As with many other civil rights activists, Belafonte was blacklisted during the McCarthy era. During the 1963 Birmingham campaign, he bailed King out of the Birmingham, Alabama jail and raised $50,000 to release other civil rights protesters. He contributed to the 1961 Freedom Rides, supported voter registration drives, and helped to organize the 1963 March on Washington. He later recalled, Paul Robeson had been my first great formative influence. You might say he gave me my backbone. Martin King was the second, and he nourished my soul. Throughout his career, Belfonte was an advocate for political and humanitarian causes, such as the anti-apartheid movement and USA for Africa. From 1987 until his death, he was a UNICEF goodwill ambassador. During the Mississippi Freedom Summer of 1964, he bankrolled the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, flying to Mississippi that August with Sidney Poitier and $60,000 in cash and entertaining crowds in Greenwood. In 1968, Belfonte appeared on a Petula Clark primetime television special on NBC. In the middle of a duet of On the Path of Glory, Clark smiled and briefly touched Belafonte's arm, which prompted complaints from Doyle Lott, the advertising manager of the show's sponsor, Plymouth Motors. Lott wanted to retake the segment, but Clark, who had ownership of that special, told NBC that the performance would be shown intact or she would not allow it to be aired at all. The newspapers reported the controversy. Lott was relieved of his responsibility, and when the special aired, it attracted high ratings. Belafonte taped an appearance on an episode of the Smother Brothers, Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour, to be aired on September 29, 1968, performing a controversial Mardi Gras number intercut with footage from the 1968 Democratic National Convention riots. CBS censors deleted the segment. The full unedited content was broadcast in 1993 as part of a complete Smothers Brothers Comedy Hour syndication package. In 1985... Belafonte helped organize the Grammy Award-winning song We Are the World, a multi-artist effort to raise funds for Africa. He performed in the Live Aid concert that same year. In 1987, he received an appointment to UNICEF as a goodwill ambassador. Following his appointment, Belafonte traveled to Dakar, Senegal, where he served as chairman of the International Symposium of Artists and Intellectuals for African Children. He also helped to raise funds along with more than 20 other artists, in the largest concert ever held in sub-Saharan Africa. Or Saharan Africa. In 1994, he embarked on a mission to Rwanda and launched a media campaign to raise awareness of the needs of Rwandan children. In 2001, he visited South Africa to support the campaign against HIV and AIDS. In 2002, AfriCare awarded him the Bishop John T. Walker Distinguished Humanitarian Service Award for his efforts. In 2004, he traveled to Kenya to stress the importance of educating children in the region. He had been involved in prostate cancer advocacy since 1996 when he was diagnosed and successfully treated for the disease. On June 27th of 06, he received the BET Humanitarian Award at the 2006 BET Awards. He was named one of nine 2006 Impact Award recipients by AARP, the magazine, and then on October 19th of 2007, represented UNICEF on Norwegian television to support the annual telethon and helped raise a world record of $10 per Norwegian citizen. Belafonte was also an ambassador for the Bahamas, and he sat on the board of directors of the Advancement Project. He also served on the Adversary Council of the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation. Belafonte was a longtime critic of U.S. foreign policy. 
and he began making controversial political statements on the subject in the early 80s. At various times, he made statements opposing the U.S. embargo on Cuba, praising Soviet peace initiatives, attacking the U.S. invasion of Grenada, praising the Abraham Lincoln Brigade, honoring Ethel and Julius Rosenberg, and praising Fidel Castro. He's also known for his visit to Cuba that helped ensure hip-hop's place in Cuban society. And according to Jeffrey Baker's article, Hip Hop Revolution, Nationalizing Rap in Cuba, in 1999, Belafonte met with representatives of the rap community immediately before meeting with Castro. This meeting resulted in Castro's personal approval of, and hence the government's involvement in, the incorporation of rap into his country's culture. In a 2003 interview, Belafonte reflected upon this meeting's influence. When I went back to Havana a couple years later, the people in the hip-hop community came to me to see me, and we hung out for a bit. They thanked me profusely, and I said, why? And they said, because your little conversation with Fidel and the Minister of Culture on hip-hop led to there being a special division within the ministry, and we've gotten our own studio. Belafonte was an active in the anti-apartheid movement. In 87, he was the master of ceremonies at a reception honoring African National Congress President Oliver Tambo at Roosevelt House, Hunter College in New York City. And the reception was held by the American Committee on Africa, the ACOA, and the Africa Fund. He was a board member of the Trans-Africa Forum and the Institute for Policy Studies. Belfonte achieved widespread attention for his political views in 2002 when he began making a series of comments about President George W. Bush, his administration, and the Iraq War. During an interview with Ted Littner for San Diego's 760 KFMB on October 10, 2002, Belfonte referred to Malcolm X. He said, as an old saying in the days of slavery, there were those slaves who lived on the plantation." And there were those slaves who lived in the house. You got the privilege of living in the house if you served the master. Do exactly the way the master intended to have you serve him. That gave you privilege. Colin Powell is committed to come into the house of the master as long as he would serve the master according to the master's purpose. And when Colin Powell dares to suggest something other than what the master wants to hear, he will be turned back out to pasture and you don't hear much from those who live in the pasture. Belafonte used the quotation to characterize former United States Secretaries of State Colin Powell and Condoleezza Rice. Powell and Rice both responded with Powell calling the remarks unfortunate and Rice saying, I don't need Harry Belafonte to tell me what it means to be black. The comment resurfaced in an interview with Amy Goodman for Democracy Now! in 2006. In January of 06, Belfonte led a delegation of activists, including actor Danny Glover and activist professor Cornell West, to meet the Venezuelan president, Hugo Chavez. In 05, Chavez, an outspoken Bush critic, initiated a program to provide cheaper heating oil for poor people in several areas of the United States. Belfonte supported this initiative, and he was quoted as saying during the meeting with Chavez, no matter what the greatest tyrant in the world the greatest terrorist in the world, George W. Bush says, we're here to tell you not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of the American people support your revolution. Belafonte and Glover met again with Chavez in 2006. The comment ignited a great deal of controversy, and Hillary Clinton refused to acknowledge Belafonte's presence at an award ceremony that featured both of them. AARP, which has just named him one of its 10 Impact Award honorees in 2006, released this statement following the remarks. AARP does not condone the matter and tone which he has chosen and finds his comments completely unacceptable. During a Martin Luther King Jr. Day speech at Duke University in 2006, he compared the American government to the hijackers of the September 11th attacks, saying, what is the difference between that terrorist and other terrorists? In response to criticism about his remarks, Belafonte asked, what do you call Bush when the war he puts us in to date has killed almost as many Americans as died on 
and the number of Americans wounded in war is almost triple. By most definitions, Bush can be considered a terrorist. And when he was asked about his expectation of criticism for his remarks on the war in Iraq, Harry Belafonte responded, bring it on. Dissent is central to any democracy. In another interview, he remarked that while his comments may have been hasty, he felt that the Bush administration suffered from arrogance wedded to ignorance, and its policies around the world were morally bankrupt. In a January 2006 speech to the annual meeting of the Arts Presenters Members Conference, Belafonte referred to the new Gestapo of Homeland Security, saying, You can be arrested and have no right to counsel. During a Martin Luther King Jr. Day speech at Duke University in Durham, North Carolina, in January of, 20, of 2006, Belafonte said that if he could choose his epitaph, it would read, Harry Belafonte, Patriot. In 2004, he was awarded the Domestic Human Rights Award in San Francisco by Global Exchange. In the 1950s, Belafonte was a supporter of the African American Student Foundation, which gave a grant to Barack Obama Sr., the late father of 44th U.S. President Barack Obama, to study at the University of Hawaii in 59. In 2011, he commented on the Obama administration and the role that popular opinion played in shaping its policies. I think Obama plays the game that he plays because he sees no threat from evidencing concerns for the poor. On December 9th of 2012, in an interview with Al Sharpton on MSNBC, Belafonte expressed dismay that many political leaders in the United States continue to oppose Obama's policies even after his re-election. The only thing left for Barack Obama to do is to work like a third world dictator and just put all of these guys in jail. You're violating the American desire. February 1st, 2013. Belafonte received the NAACP's Spring Garn Medal. And in the televised ceremony, he counted Constance L. Rice among those previous recipients of the award whom he regarded highly for speaking up to remedy the ills of the nation. In 2013, he was named a Grand Marshal of the New York City Pride Parade alongside Edie Windsor and Earl Fowix. 2016, he endorsed Vermont U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders in the Democratic primary, saying, I think he represents opportunity. I think he represents a moral imperative. I think he represents a certain kind of truth that's not often evidenced in the course of politics. Belfonte was an honorary co-chairman of the Women's March on Washington, which took place on January 21st, 2017, the day after the inauguration of Donald Trump as president. And he was a fellow at the Sanders Institute. He liked and often visited the Caribbean island of Bonaire. He and Maurice Nim of Orangestad Aruba formed a joint venture to create a luxurious private community on Bonaire named Belnam, a portmanteau of the two men's names. Construction began on June 3, 1966. The neighborhood is managed by the Belnam Caribbean Development Corporation, and Belfonte and Nem served as its first directors. 2017, Belnam was home to 717 people. Belfonte and Marguerite Bird were married from 1948 to 1957. They had two daughters, Adrienne and Sherry Belafonte. They separated when Bird was pregnant with Sherry. Adrienne and her daughter Rachel Blue founded the Anair Foundation Experience, focused on humanitarian work in Southern Africa. In 1953, Belafonte was financially able to move from Washington Heights, Manhattan, into a white neighborhood in East Elmhurst, Queens. Belafonte had an affair with actress Joan Collins during the filming of Island in the Sun. March 8, 1957, Belafonte married his second wife, Julie Robinson, a former dancer with the Catherine Dunham Company who was of Jewish descent. And after 47 years of marriage, Belfonte and Robinson divorced in 2004. April of 08, he married Pamela Frank, a photographer. He has five grandchildren, Rachel and Brian, through his children with Marguerite Bird and Maria, Serafina and Amadeus, 
through his children with Robinson. In 1998, Belafonte contributed a letter to Liv Ullman's book, Letter to My Grandchild, and he died from congestive heart failure at his home on the upper west side of Manhattan, New York City, five days ago, April 25th, 2023, at the age of 96. He's also released 30 studio albums and 8 live albums and achieved critical and commercial success. He's been in so much television, concert videos, theater. He's gotten alkalids and legacies from the Ego Honorary and a whole host of others from the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. And the list goes on and on. Wherever Harry Belafonte was, you can rest assured he came out of it with some pretty positive results. And there you have it, folks. Harry Belafonte, also known as Harold George Belafonte Jr. We will miss you and will always remember your great career in your life. Well, next week on our program, going back to what we're looking at in our series of legends here on... The Legacy of Queens. We'll look at the mayor, politician, lawyer, political commentator, film critic, and television personality. And he served in the United States House of Representatives from 1969 to 1977 and was mayor of New York City from 1978 to 1989. We'll look at the man who passed back in... 2013 at the age of 88 and was born in Crotana Park East section of the Bronx. We'll look at Ed Irving Koch. Edward Irving Koch, known as Mayor Koch. We'll look at him next week on episode 74 of The Legacy of Queens. I mentioned at the top of the program, too, I know we're going a little bit longer than scheduled here on our show, in our program. I mentioned at the top of the show that we are still on um, what is now Spotify for podcasters, as Anchor has been bought out officially by Spotify. So Spotify is the ruler of Anchor, always has been, but the merge has finally put them together, and now Spotify proudly can say we are Spotify for podcasters. We are still on YouTube and hope that you will subscribe to our channel, The Legacy of New York, where all of our back episodes are being uploaded as we speak. In fact, we just uploaded episode number, was it 57 or 58? I'm not really sure. I'll have to look at that again. <laughs> Here we go. The YouTube studio pop. It was Conrad Janis. I know. And that's episode 58 right now. And it's running at a very steady 34 views with three likes. And we also uploaded um, Jack Barry. And uh, it's interesting to note that Madeline Khan got a whopping 112 views. That is fantastic, folks. We thank you for that continued support. Just to let you also know that our legacy episode 51 of Camille Ferraro well, still dominates in the legacy of New York at 1,014 views. Second, by far, is Ron Jeremy with 881. We'll give you a running total of all of that, the analytics and everything, toward the last program of our season three, which is coming to an end on June 1st. That first, that first Sunday in June will be our last show of the third season of the Legacy of Queens. And we go into the fourth season starting this September, where I will be celebrating 14 years as a podcaster. More about that later on. But right now, we leave you. And we say thank you for your continued support of our show. Remember, folks, always be honest, be real, and keep it simple, stupid kiss. We'll see you next week. Have a good night. Bye-bye. Thank <laughs> you.